down and where you're playing with blood so champion there's the mid-range build where you are you know it's the card you expect to see butcher the horde and friends and then there's this build of it where you're going all the way up just playing nothing but sweepers and planeswalkers yeah and this one's very controlling so temple of mouse is how we're going to start things off here for butler top card's going to go to the bottom temple of malady One of these players is playing tomorrow morning. We're going to find out who it is. Well, maybe. Tiebreakers and such. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose. It's not... I suppose. I like to lock it in a little early. Nick Miller described this as a match that may or may not matter. Fair enough. For top eight implications. But understood, understood. Pluto Delta is going to get sacrificed here by John. That's an island. So DC is the one card that I am disappointed it hasn't seen more play. Well, it's the one with the highest deck building cost. Unlike the other powerful three color cards like Siege Rhino, uh, Mantis Rider to a lesser extent, Butcher the Horde, you can't just slap Sidisi into a deck. It's, it's got to be part of a larger plan. So just a harder card to play with. Read them bones. Crackling doom among the cards Jesse Butler is looking at here. And this is really a great opening for Jesse, even though the game really hasn't gotten underway. You can see he has end hostilities in hand, so he can allow John to build up his board, draw some cards with things like Read the Bones. If anything too big happens, he can always crackling doom it, but it, this is setting up to be a really nice end hostilities. Here's the DC. Turn over a couple of cards. None of them are creatures, though, so no 2-2 two -two to go along with it. Thought sees the draw here from Butler. And he will play that. So course of crew fix, a Seder Wayfinder, a Doomweight Giant, a Lanimal Waste, and a copy of Opulent Palace are the cards that we will that will be revealed, excuse me, and Butler will select one of them. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Star City crew for the uh, closing at the end of this round. So you have any purchases? And I think that I like taking the courser out of this hand. Jesse's gonna play such a long game Thank that the so incremental improvement to John's draw step does mean something. Yeah, I can see it, I'm right there with you. This Mardu mid-range deck is all about just trading one for one and, and getting its two for ones in. So even though the life gain doesn't really matter, of course they're finding some random lands where the course of the game is significant. Let's see what John can do here. Butler does have a crackling with the ready, so here's a whip. And that was this is quite the development here because yeah. now the I'm going to completely contain you with end hostilities game plan is no longer an option. Heroes Downfall going to take care of that. Opium Palace going to come into play. And now you do have to fear Whip of Erebus. This was shaping it to be a very easy game for Jesse, and now it's really gotten was. very hard. There's Soren. Going to take down. Vampire token coming. There's Temple of Silence. Take a look at the top. Chandra stays up there and we're heading back pharaoh's way pharaoh will draw looks like he may have picked up another copy of sadisi here he's going to activate the whip and maybe might just hard cast sadisi this turn instead there is some argument for extracting what you can out of the whip while you can because a deck like Jesse could easily have Banishing Light in it. Yep. And at this point, I feel like John's entire game is is hubbed around this whip. Well, that's the card that lets him stay in it. Yeah, yep. that's for sure. There's whip activation. Sidisi's going to come on back. And it's going to bring a zombie along with it. So there that is. And of course, it does have haste, so it gets to give the beat downs. Turn over a couple of cards. Another zombie coming. It's a really nice turn. It's hard to weather the storm of all this. Yeah. Gonna gain three life, too, and kill the vampire token. Land of War Wastes is the land. Seder Wayfinder is gonna come in, turn over a couple of cards. Fourth card is a creature. There was a courser there, too. So Forest will go to the hand. 
and get a zombie token. This is just an unreal turn. I know there's been hostilities in the grip, obviously, but that's kind of just the power of the Salt Eye Reanimator deck. Yeah. Being able to do that. I mean, that's all in one turn. That's just simply off a of whip activation. That's it. And in a game where it looked like John had nothing going on. Yeah. So after Butler, yeah, you can sweep everything away, and that's pretty good, but you still have to worry about what Whip Veribos can bring back, which is a lot of stuff. Patrick, do I, have permission, do I have your permission to play that deck? Sure. You can do whatever you want, man. Yes. And hostilities. Going to clear everything up. Soren's going to get cashed in. Vampire token. Pass the turn back. Will Butler over to Pharaoh. And Jesse cashing in here because John can just whip something out of the graveyard. So not the best to get so little out of the Soren, but there wasn't really much else to be done. Here's the DC trigger. Couple of cards. Seems like this thing never misses. Oh, Hornet Queen down there too now. Yikes. And now Seder Wayfinder. Turn over a couple of cards. And there's a Temple of Mystery. The rest will go back there. And pass the turn back. Butler on tap with just a Vampire Token in play. He'll draw a card. You know he's got a Chandra. He's also got a copy of Crackling. Leave another Soren over there, too. How about we check that main deck for any Banishing Lights? Any way to get this whip off the table? Well, that's the big problem, right? There is an Utter End. Looking, looking, looking. None by my look. He can play Liliana Vesta Tutor up the Utter End. So, a virtual two copies. He may not have that kind of time, though. No, I don't think so. Three mana. Let's make it four. Chandra. So that'll come in. That'll take care of the Wayfinder. Deal one to Pharaoh as well. Looks like just pass the turn back. The problem here for Butler is just the timing on when he can cast Crackling Doom and how effective it can be. Well, all these one-for-one -one removal spells, none of these really matter in the long term. As long as Whip of Erebo stays in play, John's going to be have more than enough resources to work through random one-for-one one -for -one removal spells. Yeah, got a Hornet Queen in the graveyard. The fact that he can cast the Crackling Doom once John goes to attack step is nice, because that means that he doesn't get to attack, nor can he whip it back to attack. So, you know, it's a small victory. Yeah. It's not anything major, but, you know, you kind of take what you can get. Well, it gives Jesse two more looks uh, at an utter end next turn. Yeah. And then maybe he can start playing Magic again. Oh, boy. Never mind. That's the soul of Innistrad. That thing is furious. And as powerful of a card as Chandra is, it doesn't really stand up very well to that. Here's a Magma Jet. Yeah, it's targeting you. You can Magma Jet looking for Utter End. Then zero the Chandra and hope. Yep. And then all he has to do is either beat this thing or the Whip of Erebos. <laughs> yeah. A million things in the graveyard. Jeez, oh, Pete's. Oh, there's Soren. Yep, thumbs up indeed. You have a vampire. You also have a large problem. And it is the soul of Innistrad. Draw a card. Yeah, it's time to attack. Oof. Uh, yep, a jump block is pretty easy. Gonna gain six life. Back up whipping Pharaoh's hand now too. And I'm afraid that's the check mark there. Yeah, I think so too. So I think Jesse, the only way to, to play here is by getting that card off the table, and if you can't do that... And we don't see this as Souls very often, but actually getting to activate the ability with it in play. Yep. And so that's what's happening right now with Soul of Innistrad is, you know, normally you think of these things as having Texman in their graveyard, but you get to do it when they're in play, too. And now he gets to bring back three creatures. So he's going to get back Seder Wayfinder, Sadisi, and the Courser. I got to find out at Grand Prix Sydney that that card's a combo with Ornithopter. That's a lot of blocking. <laughs> that is a lot of blocking. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get through that one, could you? No. <laughs> I could not. 
Well, sometimes you got to learn the hard way, I guess. Yeah. Plains Walkers are powerful. We'll see if they can keep Butler in this game. It's going to zero Chandra. Anger of the Gods is interesting. Will he cast that now, though? The other card in his hand, I believe, is Elspeth. I think he's just going to let that go. Play Elspeth. Four, five, and six mana coming. See how he wants to use Soren, though. I think that's an interesting part of the equation. I think he's just on the cash in plan again. Yeah. Not trying to get too fancy. Not a bad plan to be on, honestly. The issue here is it does this allow John to take care of the Elspeth. Because he can whip something into play. This is another way to, to do this. Yeah, this is getting ugly. Doomwick out there, too. I mean, John hasn't even touched his graveyard in several turns because he's had better substitute. Yeah, he hasn't needed to. Yeah. Jesse Butler's going to concede the game because he can't come back from this. It's just too much. And John Farrell's going to win game number one here with Saltai Reanimator over Marjorie Midrange. We'll turn our attention to the sideboard. We'll start with Butler, where you'll find four copies of Nixley's Ram, three Burmaz, two Wingmate Rocks, two Ashcloth Phoenix, an Anger of the Gods, an Utter End, a Glare of Heresy, and an Erase. Give me that Utter End. Give me that Erase immediately. Yeah, and I think the, the Anger plan is pretty good here. Exiling is valuable. It's a good answer to, to, to Sadisi. I don't really like a, a lot going on on the sideboard other than that, but having more answers to Whip of Erebos is great for him. What do we see on the other side after a dominating first game? Two Negate, three Thoughtseize, two Drown and Sorrow, a Liliana Vest, three Reclamation Sage, four copies of Ashiok, Nightmare Weaver. I like the Thoughtseizes and the Negates. I think the Liliana is fine as well. That was a beating. That was a, that was a beating. That game one was a one-sided beating. Unlike, I mean, I've seen some games of Magic in my day, but that was a one-sided beating. John had so many resources left over at the end of that game that it, it, it was ridiculous. And just uh, my, the thought in my head right now is just like, why don't we, why don't we see this deck more? Well, some of the tools are a little cumbersome. Okay. And I think the games where you don't have CDC or Whip, the deck doesn't really do anything. But when it gets his shop going, it's really impressive. Yeah, and it certainly did that game. So we'll see what happens here in game number two in just a moment, but we will talk briefly about the Open Series schedule, Season 1 of 2015. Season 4 is just about done. We've only got a couple more dates left. We'll be in at Portland next week in Seattle after that, and then our Players' Championship. But for Season 1 of 2015, we're going to start in some cold weather, Columbus, Philly, D.C., and Indy. And then the Open Series moves on to Houston for the first time in Open Series history, which we're very excited about. Los Angeles, the weekend after that. Baltimore Grand Prix Miami, which will be standard. Make sure to stay tuned to MagicGP.com for more information as we get closer to that event. And then we move on to Dallas and Richmond for the Season 1 Invitational. It's going to be fun. Looking forward to it. Hopefully you don't get stuck in Indy again. Well, I'll be covering all of them, and you'll be covering nearly all of them. Most of them. Yeah. <laughs> So you if there's bad be. weather, we're going to catch the bad end of it. You are going to be traveling. Uh-huh. Hope you've got plenty of, uh, pl I was going to say episodes, editions of The Economist. What's the it's one a, I'm looking it's for? A, it's a weekly magazine, so well, it I doesn't hope you, come out in that. I hope you have one for every flight that you take. That's the problem is you can't save up the newspaper and then bring it onto the plane with you because then the news is out of date. Well, you can. You, you, that's something you actually can do. It's just less, it's less satisfying. It's probably not the best idea, but you can do that. That's all. Some news is timeless, Patrick. Uh, often it's not, but sure. <laughs> See if Jesse Butler can tie things up here in what I believe to be a pretty tough matchup for his deck. Well, I think that if John doesn't have a whip, Jesse's got full control of that game. Even Sadisi's not going to do very much because Jesse can just kill it and move on with life. So if John does not find Whip of Erebos, I think the matchup is very good for Jesse, but. That card's problematic, and Jesse does not have that many answers. He can preemptively thought seize it. He has a couple of ways to remove it. He erased two copies of Utter End post board, but that card's all sorts of trouble. It really is. It really, really is. Just a heck of a card. You know, the, the best part about this standard format so far, too, is that, you know, I know, again, Ari Lassie to win the Pro Tour with Abzan Midrange, but there's no best deck in this format. No, uh, I think that 
a lot of it is a lot of the decks are kind of about doing the same things, and then it's the particular an answer cards and threat cards that you want, and that's going to shift from week to week. Like Mardu versus Abzan, those decks are not fundamentally that much different. They play with very different cards, but but they're, they're trying to accomplish the same things, I would say. So which one of those cards you want is going to be? Which one of those decks you want to play is going to be? What threats do you want? What answers do you want? Looks like Butler's going to take a mulligan. Pharaoh taking a nice little look at his hand. There's a Hornet Queen over there. We know that. Looks like there's a Sadisi as well. Whereas in Legacy, there often is a best deck to be playing because the strategies are so disparate mm -hmm. that the decks are very different from one another, and you can identify strengths and weaknesses. You can also, you know, kind of in Legacy, identify what you want to be doing as a player. Right. And Standard does have that diversity where you can try to figure that out. And as I watch these matches kind of unfold, trying to figure that out for myself for next week, it's, it's hard to do. There's a lot of things that are really appealing. I mean, I just watched John's game, and I'm just like, yeah, I want to play that now. Because that game was just, I mean, Whip is so good right now in this format, too. I think that's the one thing to take away, not, not only from that particular game, but over the past couple of weeks. It's a really well-positioned guard right now. Not a lot of ways to blow it up. No. And when people are kind of futzing around with, with mid-range strategies, they don't have a lot of closing speed, Whip Barabos is going to be one of the better things to be doing. It's slow, but if people aren't punishing you for that. And every, I mean, everyone's starting their games on turn three, Yeah, it seems like. So you're given enough time to get a whip in play and then start taking advantage of it. And your early turns, you get to fill up your graveyard with cards like Cedar Wayfinder and Commune. And Butler's going to mulligan again very quickly. Yeah, I think he might have drawn up a new lander there. Yeah. So he has not liked what he has seen here at all. And because there's a match right next to these guys that is opting to play it out instead of draw, as far as standing is concerned, it looks like whoever wants this match is going to, uh, is going to make top eight. What Nick communicated to me was it seemed like the top eight was locked in. Mm -hmm. But if people elect to play, when maybe they can draw, maybe not, that opens up at, at least one more slot. Yeah, it looks like there is a table that is playing. So for John and Jesse, I wonder if he was live for the elimination rounds, it seems. Though Jesse on a mulligan to five here may not be live for long. He's going to four. Yikes. I don't know if he's, I mean, I think the first land hand that he had was very land heavy, which is what prompted him to mulligan. I don't know if he's seen the land since. Uh, we have some breaking news. Andrew Shroud. Six and four. Congratulations. Very Ab impressive. Absolutely. Run. Big like W there. Got a pro tour coming up in a few months, and I think he's right about hitting his peak. <laughs> he's ready, baby. Yeah, he's ready. That's pro tour top eight competitor, Andrew Shroud. I know. You. Well. <laughs> Jesse, I don't know if you can go any further, even though that hand's pretty bad. Well, it's it's Elspeth Sarkin, Crackling <laughs> Doom, and I mean, that's a... <laughs> I think you're supposed to go to three there, but I, I don't mind keeping the four card I hand. think you're... Oh, yes, Temple. Oh. That'll find you the next... A windmill slam on top. Bring it on, Pharaoh. Thoughts is going to be pretty hard to beat yes. of. Yeah, that should be a rule. Hand. That should be a rule you can't cast that. Yeah. It should be in, like, the reminder test or text or something. Jensen, you kept that card on top. Mm -hmm. So it's a land. I hope it's, like, a three-mana spell. A speculative. Yeah, just tricks. It's a read the bones. I would keep read the bones on top. I'd keep read the bones, too. Sarkin's going to leave. Elspeth and Crackling are the cards that are left. And John, you don't have a second land, right? Oh, okay. Temple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here comes a land. Yep, Temple. Leave it on top. We're doing it. Ash, I think... Oh, no, 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 no. Ashiak says we're no longer doing it. There goes oh, some cards. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Two Battlefield Forges and a Soren. It's pretty mean. After the man who mulligans to four scries and keeps on top, you're going to do that? Bang, okay. Temple. I am loving this. Keep it on top. He wants him to mill that card. Don't take up Ashiok. I have a read here. What's the top card? 
It was a land. It was a land. All right, Bermas is going that way. There's a courser. Looks like John kept a pretty good one. Take a look at the top card. Yavamaya Coast coming in. Trigger. Yavamaya Coast is the next draw. Pretty solid six-card hand here from John thus far. Yeah, not bad. I do wonder if we're supposed to crackling doom here. Looks like he will. Maybe redirect to Ashiok. We'll see. Yep. Draw. Utter okay. Yep. All right. Yep. Utter end. Kill that. Elspeth's the last card. Uh, Jesse, just hoping you don't have anything. I think John has something, though. Another Ashiok. Turn over a couple of cards. Thoughts he's Bramaz in a swamp. There's a coast. This is a commune. He's got plenty. Turn over a couple of cards. Looks like Sidisi will be added to the grip. The rest are going to go bye-bye. Ashiok among them. Those coming in from the sideboard. Four of those in John's sideboard. Surprising to see it come in for this matchup, because I don't feel like John can necessarily hold the fort down that long, but against an opponent with four cards, then sure, knock yourself out, I guess. We're we'll turning up Ashiok and hostilities. Erase. Read the bones. Those are all going to go away. Sidisi is going to come to play. Trigger it. Couple of cards, Hornet Queen among them, zombie token coming. There's a Delta, kick it back. Butler will draw an utter end. See what he wants to kill. I think he's gonna kill the Ashiok again, yep. What's interesting yep. about this too is that he does have a copy of and Hostilities in his hand. So- There's a game plan here. Look, this is a game that he can actually win if things break correctly which is a ridiculous thing to say, given that he multi four. But it wasn't like John had a bad hand here. Yeah. John doesn't have whip yet. There's a Doomweight Giant. Attack. Sidisi is going to mill. So it's going to make a zombie. We'll see the top card here in just a second. Top card is Soul of Innistrad. That has made the end hostilities plan much worse. A little bit worse, yeah, a little bit worse. Ah! I think he saw the, oh, rats. I think he saw the card down on accident. Yeah, he says, I saw that card. Yeah, Jesse has scried a few times, so we need to make sure that that's maintained. Yep. So we will get a ruling on what exactly is supposed to happen here. He says, I saw that card. Okay. Not a land, thoughts he's. So that was not land number five, which is nope. what Jesse was really looking for. Thoughts he's number one. Take a little look, Skipu. Bye bye, Doomweight Giant. Hey, you see Elspeth and her hostilities. Soul Venice drops the draw. Take a look. Sidisi. Time for attackers. Which means another zombie is going to come to play. We'll take a look at the top card, of course, here in a moment. Sater Wayfinder. Now, for John, I don't think you cast the Soul Venestrad. This is conceivably still a, a winnable game. Oh, wow. All right, draw the land, Jesse. Do it for us at home. That's not a oh, land. That's going to do it. John Farrell going to win this game and match over Jesse Butler. Two games to zero. Saltire Reanimator getting it done, truthfully, in very impressive fashion. Sidisi, Blood Tire, I know it hasn't seen a lot of play yet, but at some point, I don't know if it's now, it might be, you know, in the elimination rounds tomorrow morning, might be in a tournament down the road. That card is completely absurd. It's very powerful. It's the highest ceiling of any of the three color creatures in the set, in yeah. my opinion. But you need to be playing a black, blue, green,